My name is Monk Rowe, and we are in Clearwater Beach. I'm very pleased to have bassist John Lamb with me here today. Thank you. And I've uh, been looking forward to talking to you for a couple weeks now. Uh, you've kind of come full circle. You were born down here, weren't you? I was born in Vero Beach. Uh huh. Yes. I wasn't too proud of it at the time, but. Uh, Why is that? Well, it was a small town and nothing as far as I was concerned, and uh, it was in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Although uh, it was like a. I'm sure it was a small paradise because it was right there on the East Coast where all the beautiful beaches were. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, the attitudes were in a different direction at that time. And that's why I didn't want to be from Vero Beach. Can you tell me about those attitudes? Those attitudes I yeah. discovered one day when I, on television when I was in my 20s. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the television told me, says, hey, this is what happened to you when you were growing up in Vero Beach, or growing up in Fort Pierce, which was uh, 15 or 16 miles away, south of Vero Beach. But anyway, I was born on a farm in Vero Beach. Uh, uh, my mother used to work, uh, used to be a domestic. Mm -hmm. And uh, we played along with all kids, everybody. Everybody had a great time. And I grew up thinking that I was uh, well-adjusted and a fine young man. I felt good about myself, you know, and, and everything. And uh, then later on, uh, there was a, uh, a move where I had to go to St. Augustine at age uh, year and a half or two. Mm -hmm. And then... Uh, then my father died at age, uh, what, about three, three and a half. Oh. Then I was uh, among relatives, all kinds of relatives, and they moved me back to Fort Pierce. My mother was in Vero Beach, and she used to come by once a week to see me, and, mm -hmm. she, and I lived there with them because they could better take care of me. And so I grew up in Fort Pierce, um, another area that I stayed in until uh, graduating from high school at age 16. Uh, I didn't realize it was a big deal at the time, but most people graduated at 18. I didn't realize it, but during that time, you know, you could graduate at 16. There was nothing else to do but study. <laughs> yeah. There's no distractions. <laughs> no distractions, right? <laughs> sure. But um, I wasn't proud of the area, but like I said, because of the attitudes uh, the, among the people. I grew up uh, feeling good. Um, like I said about myself, but I discovered one day uh, watching the tube that there were different things going on as compared to other parts of the country. Uh, as far as the, uh, the working relationships, the social aspect of it, uh, uh, the equal rights, so to speak, mm -hmm. part of it. Uh, those are the things that, uh, that I didn't feel good about later on. You found out that you had grown up in an area that that was wasn't too great, cool. Yeah, wasn't too cool. Right. Yeah. Sure. But I mean, I felt good about it. I mean, mm -hmm. at, at the time as a kid, I mean, if you if you if you're born in a situation <laughs> and you don't know any differently, uh -huh. then you know it's okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And your friends were white and black. Yes. And, and everything. Sure. Else. My employ employers were were white, and I, I felt good about them. If they were very nice to me, mm -hmm. you know, and. But there were other things that were out there that, that maybe I was unaware of at that time. Uh -huh. My teachers were excellent. I loved my teachers so much that I wanted to become a teacher. And I felt that they did a very good job with what the materials they had and mm -hmm. the way they worked. Sure. After graduation, um, you had a career decision? Yeah, I had to earn some money. Yeah. Yeah, so I went to the man that was raising me at the time, uh, my uncle. I said, uh, what would you do now that you're graduated from, that I'm graduated from uh, high school? He says, I'd go in the Army. <laughs> you know, at that time, it was an option. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'd found myself walking uh, uh, 8th Street in Fort Pierce, and everything was uh, beginning to clo uh, become a little bit bored, boring. So I, I said, well, it's time to do something different. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, I went into the Air Force. I went down to Miami. Uh, I think stayed two or three days for the induction part of it. And I had to wait. Actually, I was 16 when I really applied. I had to wait till I was 17. Oh. And then when I turned 17 on, in December, 
then uh, they said, okay, we'll induct you now with your mother's permission. So my mother signed me into the Air Force. Uh, down while being in Miami, um, I ran into those social things. Because uh -huh. uh, here we are in one building uh, being tested for our, uh, for the military. And then we had a break for lunch. And he says, OK, everybody hop over across the streets and get lunch. Yeah. So I walked with the rest of the cats across the streets to get lunch. I walked in. Everybody looked up at me as if I was some, from a different planet or something. So, <laughs> and uh, so I ignored it. And they ushered me back to the kitchen oh, God. while my buddies ate. So it, uh, it was during a time when the, nothing could be done about that, you know. This was about 1950? Oh, it was, yeah, December of 50. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so uh, had my lunch and uh, <laughs> went back to the post office and con continued to enroll into the military. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when you got in the military, did Okay, they put us things? on a train, see? Yeah. Put us on a train and we went up to, uh, you know, during those days, blacks and whites had to ride in separate cars. but. One thing I noticed that on this particular coach, they put us all in the same coach. I said, mm, this is different. We were riding in the same coach, you know? So anyway, we went up through Alabama. We got into Alabama. It's time for another lunch break, right? <laughs> so this is, you have to get off the train and go across the streets and, and uh, get something to eat. So I walk right into the place there. And, and um, the guy says, uh, whispered to one of the guys, says, we can so can't serve that guy over there, you know. So, and they, they says, John, would you like me to bring you a sandwich or something? So, and we go out, you know, and I says, oh, I'll be fine. So back on the, on the, on the, uh, the train, and we hop on toward, toward San Antonio. That's where the inductees were brought in. Uh -huh. So two little incidents right there. And were you in uniform at that time? Not, that, at, not uh, at that time, not, no. Not at that time, yeah. no. So we went through the, the training and all that. And uh, by the way, I was a tuba player. Oh, okay. tuba player, yeah. yeah. And we have to backtrack. We'll talk about okay. the music, but this okay. is very interesting. Okay. Well, I, I played the tuba, and uh, there was a warrant officer in there that mm -hmm. uh, heard me play, and my tone was very good. But I could play the chromatic scale and the B flat major scale, and, mm -hmm. and my reading was down a little bit. And uh, he says, "Your reading is is not good, but you have a very good tone." He says, "I'll give you six months." to come up to PA. Mm -hmm. So he gave me a break. His name was uh, Proctor, Warrant Officer Proctor. Proctor used to be with the, the band in, uh, in Lockburn, at Lockburn, I believe. Uh, there was an all-black outfit. Uh -huh. And he eventually became a Warrant Officer. And uh, I just happened to run across him at this time. He gave me a break, so that is. That's good. Yeah. Um, now, after that little uh, bit of uh, training in uh, San Antonio, they moved us up to Montana. Oh, boy. <laughs> Great Falls, Montana. Could you imagine being there? <laughs> From Florida. Yeah. yeah. Whoa. So um, I hopped off the uh, thing, uh, the, the, the uh, what do you call it, the train, Yeah. and uh, all the snow. And, <laughs> and I'd never seen snow before. But oh, really? <laughs> that was a different experience. Uh, so they shuffle us on out to the, the air base. But after having been there at the air base for a while, I began to uh, become more involved in the music. They gave me six months, uh, like I said, to come up to par, which I did, and sort of uh, surpassed a few others that were there that had been there a few years that had become complacent, you know. Yeah. Um, then um, <clears throat> one day the first sergeant says, uh, says, we have a man on leave here. Uh, John, uh, do you play bass? I said, sure, I play bass. No problem. So I, I went over and pretended that I He didn't play bass. No, I didn't really play <laughs> bass. And uh, he says, yeah, go ahead and try it. His name is Earl Evans. He was a tech side. And he's mm -hmm. somewhere up in, somewhere, was that, Nebraska or someplace now. And uh, he says, go ahead, try it. So I, I picked it up. He says, you want to try it for a few days? I says, yeah. So I, I took it up, and I began to I learned how to tune the mm -hmm. G, D, A, and E. And uh, because of my tuba experience, I, I would play root and fifth. I learned where root yeah. and fifth were, and finger here and finger there, you know, that type of thing. 
So I did that for about two or three days, and I was good enough to play the gig that uh, Friday night, playing my root and fifth, <laughs> <laughs> and my two beat, you know, that type of yeah. thing. Yeah. And it, of course, time uh, made it a little better. Right. Um, <clears throat> and I, I began to make some kind of progress uh, somewhere, and they, they offered me uh, like a $10 job at the service club or uh -huh. uh, the NCO club or something like that. And they gave me my ten dollars, and this is pretty good. Yeah. You know, when the new, the ba old bass player came back off leave in thirty days, they wanted me instead of him. <laughs> Why? Because of my ability to feel yeah. the music and uh -huh. to feel the, the swing of it. Neat. And so this continued on, and uh, I continued to practice. Uh, and then one day uh, we had a group coming from out of town that. Uh, they played a little jazz for us, and they didn't have a bass player. So I sat in with them, you know, and they encouraged me. And I for later found out that they were living in Great Falls, that they were from in town. Mm -hmm. So uh, they encouraged me to come in, so I did. I went in, took a bass in, and sat in with them. But I later discovered that the place was off limits. Uh oh <laughs> <laughs> So I had to sneak into the club, mm -hmm. and when the, the policeman came in, I would have to get on the bandstand and play. And so I did that for a long time, maybe a couple of years, you mm -hmm. know, getting all this experience. Did you have to be in uniform when you'd go into town like that? No. That, okay, because otherwise no. you'd be like, you'd really right. stick they, out. They could it. tell me, tell yeah. by my shoes. They look oh. at my shoes. Everybody wore black shoes. Oh. <laughs> the Air Force, you know. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, what would the, can you recall that one of those very first gigs you played as a bass player, what were some of the songs that you would have played at the time. You mean with that Air Force group? Yeah. Uh, let's see. We were into Stan Kenton. No kidding. Yeah. Uh, I heard a lot of Kenton at that time because mm -hmm. the guys would bring their records that I, yeah. I didn't listen to jazz or anything okay. like that. Um, I remember Apple Honey. Mm -hmm. And da 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 dee da 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 dee da dee da dee da dee. Was that Woody Herman's? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, not uh, uh, autumn. Uh, yes, uh, something. autumn something. Yeah, autumn something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, da da dee da dee da 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 dee uh -huh. da dee da da. The saxophones. Yeah. It was a saxophone thing, yeah. and I learned the parts to that by learning to read the parts. Yeah. Okay, so you had some music. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I listened to a lot of people in, in town there. And the influences were, I heard uh, guys bring in uh, recordings of Stitt and Ammons. Mm -hmm. and I heard a uh, recording of uh, Fats Navarro. Uh, and I heard a lot of Kenton, a lot of big band. And then I heard this bass player called Safransky. Ed Safransky. Ed Safransky. Yeah. yeah. So what I did, I said, hmm, that's pretty good. Everybody seems to like it because he would feature certain people in certain sections. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I, uh, I learned Safransky's bass part, and that taught me some scales. And I had to dig for some positions. You know, they mm -hmm. didn't, weren't necessarily correct positions, but I, but I, I learned the scales from having played tuba. And, uh, and I went to town. I, see if I could find a book, and I did find a book, and it was Bobby Haggard's book. All oh, right. He had pictures on there. Yeah. Later on uh, down here, I told him about that, and I think he got a, got a kick out of it. He says, he said, that was the best book that was ever written for bass. <laughs> that was his thing. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, Bobby Haggard had some influence there by, you know, through his method. Yeah. And then some people would come through town. Uh, I remember the guy's name was Gene. That's all I remember. Blonde, had a beard had a space in front, <laughs> and uh, he's, I, said, I went over to his uh, hotel room, and I wanted to get a lesson or two, and he, what do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what I wanted to know. You're I just right. wanted, you know, <clears throat> and that was it. So that l little experience is like that. Mm -hmm. And, um, but uh, up there in uh, Montana, I had a chance to, to get to work with some of the, the musicians there. And there's one fellow by the name of Rudy Williams, Back there, played sax tenor. He says, "You know what? You sound like my my cousin." I said, "Who's your cousin?" He says, "Charles Mingus." I had never heard of Mingus, you know. Mm -hmm. That's what he said. And what was I to know? I'm just a kid that's playing a bass. And then one night on the jukebox, while playing in the same joint, I heard uh, something coming out of the box—a trio. 
I didn't really know what the combination was, but it was something. I said, said to one of the guys in the band, I said, who is that playing bass? Who is that? He said, that's Ray Brown. Oh. Ray Brown. I said, hmm. So I began to edge closer to the uh -huh. jukebox. Yeah. You know? <laughs> And, uh, and I listen, I listen to this, and mm, that sounds good, a nice tone, and sounds like a, almost like a tuba. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and then Oscar Peterson was on piano, and Herb Ellis, I believe, or either uh, Barney. Barney Kessel. Or yeah, Barney or, Kessel. Yeah, yeah. Later on in life, I, I worked with both of those guys. That's yeah. great. Uh, and then I met Ray and Oscar and all those. We did gigs together, you know. But anyway, um, I, I uh, began to investigate Ray Brown. Mm -hmm. uh, like when I went on leave, I, I heard some of uh, his things coming out of a, out of a jukebox uh, in Savannah, the trio playing. And I said, hmm, that's Oscar, huh? And then I began to investigate Charlie Parker, and I used to listen to that because guys would bring their, their music in, and I'd listen and listen and listen. I don't know if I was really learning anything, but, mm -hmm. but it was uh, a part of my, my consciousness now. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. What were you doing in the, what was your actual job in the service all My this job time? was a tuba player. So you, you got through the service <laughs> as a tuba, the tuba player? player yeah. Okay. You yeah. played for the marches? And yes, the, everything. Yeah. You played yeah. the sousaphone also? Yeah, sousaphone. <laughs> yeah. And, and then uh, I did that for about, uh, on that, that hitch for about three years. Yeah. And I learned a lot from other musicians. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the method books and observing what they were doing and right. so on. But I tell you, what, another experience I had one day in the latrine, we had to go through basic again because we hadn't completed basic in Texas. Oh. So we had to go through that again. And uh, one day I was in the latrine practicing the tuba. So one of the guys, the staff sergeants walk, walks in and says, you think you're so damn smart, what are you practicing for? <laughs> Really? <laughs> well, I'm trying to figure out where did this come from? Where, what are you practicing so much for? And I was just practicing and practicing. I, it turns out that I think he was really drunk. He mm -hmm. had been drinking a little he, And when he mm -hmm. got to that state, he went a little bit crazy. Yeah. I later on met him, too, and I confronted him with that in Vero Beach. In Vero Beach. Yeah. But I did it in such a nice way. This, the man had changed completely. He was a different yeah. person. Wow. He had had some problems in his childhood that he that he that mm -hmm. reflected in his daily yeah. living. So I understand that. Wow. No problem. Um, but anyway, uh, this uh, this experience lasted for about uh, three years. It's a military mm -hmm. experience, and I became uh, got out. Uh, but during just before getting out, I met a fellow by the name of Oscar Denard. Oscar was supposed to have been one of these guys, that, one of these brainy guys that could remember everything, you know. Yeah. yeah and he, he played that way. He used to use in St. Petersburg originally. And what is he doing up in Montana? But anyway, <laughs> I met him in Montana. And he used to talk about a place called Schillinger House. It used to be, it's the old, uh, well, Berkeley now. It's Berkeley Music, oh. School of Music. Oh, and it used oh. to be Schillinger House because Schillinger oh, right. used to, that's where, um, the Schillinger method. Quincy Jones went there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, he talked about that. And he says if he had his choices, he would go to Berkeley or mm -hmm. to Schillinger House. So somehow that stayed in my head. I said, well, I think I'll go up and try it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so uh, we, uh, <clears throat> after the discharge and working with this, this monster pianist for six months, uh, I decided to give that a shot. But prior to leaving that military again, um, uh, I was talking to this piano player, Oscar, about Ray Brown. This is a, you know this Ray Brown guy? And of course, we've been listening to Shering and all that and Oscar. Yeah. Those were the two major pianists at the time. And uh, he says, yeah, I've heard of Ray Brown. And he says, uh, he says, there's a guy down in Miami can do everything Ray can do. I says, who is that? And he says, Sam Jones. So I, I didn't know who Sam Jones was. Mm -hmm. I'd never heard of him. Later on, he was working with uh, uh, Cannonball. Cannonball, yeah. Yeah, and quite a few others. And I met him later on in my career, yeah. Um, <clears throat> anyway, I get out of the military and decide that I'd try to go back to Vera Beach. <laughs> I went to Vera Beach and uh, Got a job at, the, at a packing house, you know, make some money. That's 
you know, there wasn't anything going on there. I mean, yeah. what, what else? Everything was domestic. I tried cleaning and work. I wonder if I could work in a hospital as an orderly or something, you know? Uh -huh. <laughs> and it didn't turn out too well. I think I stayed in the, 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 um, uh, the packing house a little over a week, uh, two uh -huh. weeks. And I, I had $27 saved up. I didn't even get along with my parents, my, my mother at that time, you mm -hmm. know, because I, I had changed, you know, and even in your early 20s, uh, yeah. it's very difficult to, yeah. uh, to get along with parents at that age right. because I knew uh, quite a bit. She says, well, what you should do, John, she says, take this job until you can find something else. But there was nothing else better in Vero Beach. Mm -hmm. You know, you, have you been to Vero Beach? No. <laughs> well, it's a lot different today. <laughs> I think so. But to, it was, uh, had about 16,000 people at the time. Uh -huh. And that's a very small town. Um, so I decided to take my $27. I said, well, I'm going to Boston to Schillinger House. I didn't have any money or anything like that. So I said, I'm heading to Schillinger House. So I hopped on the bus. Is that right? Man? Yeah, hopped on the bus, moved on up. And uh, I think it was two or three days to New York. When we got there for a break, the porter outside says, where are you going? He says, I'm going to Boston. He says, what do you do? I'm a musician. He says, what are you going up there for? You, everything is right here. He says, you'll be back. <laughs> this so, is in New York? Yeah, I a, see. yeah we're yeah, taking a little break there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you'll be back. I said, OK. So I hopped on and went to Boston because I knew somebody, I had met somebody that, that was originally from Vera Beach by the name of Henderson. And uh, he says, well, coming up, we'll help you out. So I went up there, and they. I found out that he was a Pullman Porter. So they put me up in the Pullman Porter's place for, uh, what, $7 a week, you know. Oh. Couldn't be that. So they gave me a room. And uh, I tried to wait tables. I remember the first job, I tried to, to go up there, and the guy says, you got to have a tux. You know, so I had a black suit, double-breasted. It looked good, nice black suit. Um, went on, and they gave me a table and all that. And, and gave me a tray. I had never done this stuff, you know. And uh, I said, this is your table. Uh, by the way, is that a tux you have on? That's not a tux. Out. Oh, <laughs> so it was out. And uh, so anyway, I uh, ended up uh, getting a job at, uh, at Steuben's Restaurant in Boston as a dishwasher. Hmm. And I, wa I washed a few pots and pans. And I think that lasted a little over a week, too. Oh, you? <laughs> yeah. But, I, but in the meantime, I went back to Schillinger House and asked for my application fee back. I think it was, what, $25 or so. You asked for it back? Uh, yeah, I asked <clears> for it back. <throat> he says, we don't normally do this, the, uh, probably the dean. He says, but we understand your situation. This is where Herb Pomeroy and all those people taught. Right. John LaPorter and uh, yep. they teach up there. Yeah. And uh, he says, we don't normally do this, but we understand the situation. So he gave me the money back. And I took the money and applied it toward my room. And, and Did you decide not to go there? Because you, you just Well, I couldn't go it. there. I had no money. Yeah, right. But while I was in, in uh, getting my money back, I heard this beautiful bass sound coming out of the room. Somebody was bowing this instrument. I said, mm, that's so beautiful. I didn't realize that a bass could sound like that. You know, and all of this sound was filtering out. I don't have any idea t to this day who that was, mm -hmm. but uh, it stayed it stayed with me. Mm -hmm. And mm, while washing these dishes, these this pots, these pots, uh, there was a group out in the um, in the lobby playing, and mm, I, I looked out there, and guys had on the tuxes, you know, looking good. And of course, I had a little musical background. I said, hmm, that's what I'd like to do. You know, play out there in the lounge. I should be back here <laughs> in the, uh, washing these pots. So uh, <clears throat> it turns out it was uh, Joe Bruno's father that was playing in that group. And Joe Bruno, I met uh, 20 years later down, or much later, down in uh, Sarasota. I also met his son. Mm -hmm. So I met the father when I was in the kitchen, but not formally, but through uh -huh. his music. Yeah. And then I met the son later on down in Sarasota, and then his other son, is his son, um, who plays bass. So we have uh, three, three Brunos, three. yeah. Wow. Um, but anyway, I, I, after that little experience, I got, got a job uh, 
playing in another club in Eddie Levine's place on the mm -hmm. corner of Mass and Columbus in Boston. And uh, they said, uh, hmm, they gave me an audition and all that. So I played my Ed Safransky solo. <laughs> all right. <laughs> They had a little quartet, you know. Yeah. I mean, that's all I knew. Yeah. So I played, and I'd walk a little time, and I had my my chubby Jackson model uh, five string bass. Oh, you did? <laughs> yeah. Oh, be darned. That's right. He had his own little. Yeah, he had his five had string, his string bass. Yeah. Bass. <laughs> but you know, later on, I discovered that Slam Stewart tuned his bass with a high C on top, mm -hmm. and I didn't realize that at the time. Oh, and then in that little corner, we had the hi hat, and we had all the jazz cats come over there. Uh, are you familiar with Boston, Mass no. Columbus? Uh, we had uh, that little corner. We had Wally's across the street where I met Pops, Pops Foster. Pops Foster was 75 about that time. He was claimed to be the first guy that began plucking the bass. Mm -hmm. And I said, Pops, come on over. And I want you to catch my act and see how, how I do on the bass, you know. And so he came out and checked out my sound. He said, yeah, good sound, you know. And, you know, encouragement. Right. And in this little joy, Eddie Levine's, I met all kinds of musicians. They used to come up and visit our leader, who was Dean Earl. And as far as uh, my style and being, being a gentleman and being in the business and all that, there was a fellow by the name, like I said, his name was Dean Earl. And he, he talked about good manners and mm -hmm. musicianship and personality, being on and off the stand and being... Uh, not drinking excessively. He says, if you're going to drink, always have a good meal first. You know, oh, that type of thing. Yeah. And so he sort of, it was like a mentor. Yeah. And, and so Dean was, uh, was also a graduate of uh, Berkeley. He also taught there and uh, all those things. And he advised me as far as schools are concerned. He says, he says if I were you, he says, uh, he says, uh, I would go to a different school. He says, uh, Berkeley doesn't offer you a teaching degree. Uh huh. So I, I thought about it. Yeah. Thought about it. So I went over to the New England Conservatory and I hang around the practice rooms a little bit, getting the feel of things and all that. And um, in the meantime, at the high head across the streets, I used to hear all of these groups come in, all these small groups. Guys like Shadow Wilson, Miles Davis, and Ella Fitzgerald, and Hot Lips Page, and all those kind of people. And then uh, there was another place called the Showboat, not the Showboat. Uh, that was a famous club in New Orleans at one time. Uh, there was another club in Boston, George Ween. Oh, yes, yeah. Story Storyville. Storyville. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. George Ween owned that. And, and the, big, the big man in town was Jimmy Wood, the, the bass player. Mm -hmm. And Junior Raglan, whenever Duke would come to town, would come by and sit in and he'd play his things. And I'd listen to these guys and, and, and begin to pick up on what they, I said, now what's so appealing about that? I said, I, said, I can do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so on. And got a chance to hear Basie over at Storyville and I heard Duke and I heard Charlie Parker and uh, uh, Prez. Uh, Along with Duke Spann and the singers and Joe Williams, yeah, and that uh, that thing every day that they put out. Every day I have the blues. Yes, I used to go up to the jukebox late at night and listen to that all the time. Listen to that bass player Ed Jones mm -hmm. from Ed Jones. Yeah, and I listen to those kind of things. And uh, and in the meantime, I had a gig after hours in uh, right across the streets there. Um, what was it called? Uh, I don't know, but anyway, it was a little after hours joint. We play from maybe two to five in the morning, you know what I mean? That type wow. of thing. And one night, uh, Billie Holiday walks in and she sits down with her on the side there with her little dog. It was a Chihuahua, I think it was. Uh -huh. And uh, so I put my hand out like this, uh, like this, and the dog grabbed me. <laughs> he says, honey, don't do that. She says, always do like this. You know, like, put your hand out like that. He oh. says, he won't bite you then. She kept her little dog in her purse. <laughs> and she sang one or two tunes with us that night. Really? Yeah, it's just, just an informal thing. Yeah. Yeah. We're still in the uh, Boston years, huh? Yeah, well. And then, and then um, the Boston thing just went on for a while, and then uh, my day, uh, my night gig ran out after a year. Mm hmm And... Um, but I was making $50 a week, you know. And all the other guys says, well, 
that's a poor playing club. Uh, it's, it's the guy didn't pay you too much money, but to me, fifty bucks. It was fifty dollars, yeah, you yeah. know. I, and I, I know I ate a lot of sardines, and <laughs> and I ate a lot of uh, 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 what do you call them? What do you call those things? Uh, peanuts and coke. <laughs> I ate a lot of those. Could fill you, you up. Could, yeah. Fill you up. And I would sleep late in the afternoon, so I wouldn't use up so much energy. You know, that, that Man, time. Man, you were it. paying some dues, I guess. <laughs> I, I think I lost about. Um, at that time, I was lost about 10 or 15 pounds. Of course, today that would be great, but uh, you know, I could do. Anyway, uh, that went on for a while, and I said, I have to do something about this. You know, this is, it's time for me to, to make a, a change. Because mm -hmm. I'd heard other people talking about this. Well, uh, I need a, uh, that they needed a trade, and they were tired of going from one gig to the other and so on. But during this time in Boston, I got one good gig. Uh, I think I had a week with Ella. She was coming through Boston, or was in Boston already, mm -hmm. and they needed a bass player for Philadelphia. So uh, I went down to the station with my bass. I was supposed to meet them, and I looked around, I didn't see anybody, no Ella, no, no anybody. You know, I'm just a kid, you know, nobody. And uh, so I says, well, maybe I should just hop on the train and I'll see them at the next station or somewhere. So what I did, I don't know why I did this, but I put my base in the, the baggage room, <laughs> left it there, and I stayed on the train, and sure enough, there they were, waiting at the platform, and everybody's looking for me. I wonder where the kid is, you know? There was Marcus Foss, the drummer who called me Junior, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And Don Abney, who was a piano player. And all these guys were well seasoned, you know? And so Ellis is, oh, there he is. Uh, Say, where's your base, honey? <laughs> I said, this is the station. And then I tried to explain it, and I couldn't explain it. So she's, that made her very, that upset her quite a bit. And she says, well, she says, she says, uh, she says honey, always keep your bass with you. She says, Ray always took his bass with him wherever he went. You know, because she used to be married to Ray. You know? Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we hop on the train and, and uh, go to Philly. But uh, my mentor, Dean, uh, told me, he says, always keep a diamond on your finger. So whenever you have a problem, you'll be, you know, you'll be able to eat anyway, you know. So, so, upon so it. I had a little, I had a little, little diamond ring uh, that I had bought, you know, and because I was following my, my mentor, see, uh -huh. which was excellent advice. So I went to the music store and they had an old bass in the corner. I says, well, look, man, I says, I'm working down here at Pep's and all I have is my ring. Now I use your bass for a couple of days. So, uh, he looked at the ring and he says, yeah, okay. So I, he let loan his basis. He asked me who was I working with. I told him Ella Fitzgerald and that type of thing. And so uh, <laughs> and uh, I took the base and went down and worked with her a few days. And then in the meantime, we sent for my other base. And so it arrived, my Chubby Jackson model. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and so I took it back. That's how that happened. I see. One week with Ella. Yeah, I bet the base from the pawn shop didn't have five strings on it. <laughs> well, actually, actually, no, it didn't. Uh, actually, it wasn't a pawn shop. It was a music store. Oh, OK. I mean, all the musicians oh, music, used to yeah. go in there. Yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, I bought my Ray Brown method book from there. Uh huh. You know, sure. Mm -hmm. So. You entered into your Philadelphia kind of time from there, yeah. is that yeah. right? Well, no, that, that's, uh, that's another story. Oh. <laughs> that's another story. Uh, <clears throat> a week in Philadelphia, and then I went to Atlantic City for a while, and then there was no more, there was no more work. I said, mm. now, yeah, what's happening, you know? I looked at my, I began to assess myself and said, well, well, what's, what's happening? I says, you do have a skill. You can play the tuba. <laughs> you, can, mm -hmm. you had a military career, uh, well, three or four years anyway. And uh, I says, you're young and all those kind of things. He says, it's time for you to do something. I hit rock bottom there as far as employment goes. And I'd see all these prosperous looking people and I says, there's nothing out here that I know how to do. What can I do? But there for a short time, I did get a job in a haberdashery for about six months. And that had me going for a while. I substituted for a saxophone player. So between those two gigs, working a little bit at nights and uh, the haberdashery, I was able to make it. But after that, everything was, you know, because we had to live from day to day. Um, so I decided, I says, well, I think I'll go back into the Air Force. 
So finally, that was my decision. I went back in the Air Force. And I went back in this time with one strike. Before, I had no stripes, okay. but I had one strike. I went to the band, and the guys had heard that I had worked a week with Ella, or mm -hmm. had worked with a few musicians around yeah. Boston, you know, and I had a little prestige, yes, and, you know. you came with a reputation. Yeah, and had a little, uh, a little tuba experience because I had done that before. So I was a little bit ahead of the game. But I, I said, uh, I have to really do something about my abilities. I said, uh, I decided right there and then that I was going to become the world's greatest bass player. I decide, I, that's what I put into my head. I said, you have to do it. I don't know why, I think it's, I was sort of like driven. I, I, I had experienced the hunger, <laughs> hunger, and I experienced the disappointments and all those kind of things. And I had a, a craving or a love, and then all these social things that I'd experienced before were coming through. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. From what I experienced as a child. I didn't know what they were, uh, but, uh, but I had to express all of this in some way. Otherwise, it would have come out in the form of pimples. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, I went back into the Air Force, and, and, I, and I did this thing. And uh, within six months, I had an awakening. I mean, really. Uh, I hit a low one day, and then I had to go through these changes. Uh, I don't know, it's ment yeah, mental, physical. Then it's like uh, an awareness uh, came over me. Uh, and I began to investigate spirituality a little bit. Uh, all psychology, all the books that I could read on the subjects that were in the, on the base library, I began to investigate. And I got rid of all my jazz records. I had a whole, you know, slew of, I just tossed all of that aside. And while this was happening, going through this change, uh, one of the guys came in in the barracks one day and says, John, he says, I found you a base teacher. As if, you know, like, he just came out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. The guy used to play with uh, the Cleveland Orchestra. His name was Ted Shetler. He played with him for about, well, quite a number of years. Mm -hmm. Over 10 years, had to be. And uh, he was also a pianist, concert pianist. And after we interviewed each other, I found out that uh, he uh, couldn't get a job playing concert piano, so he went to bass. Uh -huh. Yeah. And he had studied with the premier of the first chair of Boston. Uh, so I, in a sense, I had gotten my teacher indirectly through him, yeah. you know. And uh, Mr. Shetler stayed, I stayed with him for a couple of years, two or three years, and I learned what I could. Talk about an awful sound that I got out of the instrument. It was terrible. At K bass, it was terrible. Mm -hmm. Stretchy. Didn't know anything about bows or anything. Yeah. And I, he, he taught me out of the Samandel book, Franz Samandel. That's the so-called base Bible. Yeah. And um, we, um, we worked with that, and I scratched my way through it for about two or three years. <laughs> <laughs> and then somebody came up to me and said, uh, John, you want to go overseas? There's an opening in, uh, in Iceland. <laughs> Oh, jeez. <laughs> I, said, I said, yeah, sign me up. I wanted to get out of Roswell, New Mexico. That's where we were. Oh. We were in Roswell, New Mexico. Man, I tell you, you've been to some of the hot spots. Oh, the definitely. Yeah. That's where they had the UFO right. uh, sightings or something. And by the way, in Roswell, I had some experiences, too, like social things. Yeah. You know, like they had a sign up on the wall that says, we refuse the right to serve anyone, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm a GI, you know, off base there trying to... Uh, have a little fun with my buddies, and that's, that was on the wall. And the same thing happened in Montana, by the way. That's mm -hmm. almost, that's not too far from the border, you know. Um, <clears throat> so in each place, I had a little touch of that social problem. Did that attitude also include your, your fellow uh, military people? If it did, I, I didn't notice it too okay. much. Um, I don't know why I didn't pay too much attention. It was just something I just didn't notice. I guess uh -huh. I was lucky that way. Yeah. Uh, not unless I had a direct confrontation. Mm -hmm. If I had a direct confrontation, then I would sort of listen to it and, uh, and ignore it somehow. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but it just, just went on. 
came out in the music, I guess. Yeah. Because uh, now that you asked that question, I did have a experience with a guy that I went on leave with once. He was a bagpipe player up in Montana. Um, and we were going along, and he was from Tennessee. And he said, uh, do you know what a nigga is? <laughs> you know, that type of thing. And I, and I just sort of like dismissed it. Boom. Gone. Um, that's the only direct thing that mm -hmm. I can recall uh, during that time. But back to Roswell, then they, they said, well, uh, Iceland, we could ship you up there. And then they found out that I was black, and they said, we don't have any black GIs up there in Iceland. So I couldn't go to Iceland. So instead, I chose Shreveport, Louisiana, which was just as bad. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> so we went to Shreveport, and, uh, and everybody was fine on base, you know. Uh -huh. But the problem was off base oh. because of the city law ordinances, you know. Uh, whites and blacks couldn't sit on the same row in the front or together or in the back together. One had to be in the back as if he was going to work, you know what I mean? And I had another thing that happened there. Uh, while I was in this spirituality thing, we had a fellow that used to come out from the, to the air base once a week because I couldn't go in and, to, to, and be with the, the group because of the laws. And they were all white, see? Um, but anyway, he'd come, out, he'd come out to the base and we he was a captain, and I was just little, whatever it was, two or three stripes. Yeah. And he'd walk in the barracks, and everybody would snap to, you know, and he'd say, hey, John, how are you? <laughs> yeah, he'd say. <laughs> yeah, that no type kidding. of thing. Uh -huh. And uh, because uh, he was there to help me with, with my, and we'd find some place, you know, a corner or yeah. somewhere, and we'd talk, or a building, yeah. And we'd talk about spiritual things, uh -huh. and he did that for as long as I was uh, there in the, your base. And what, when you were in Louisiana, what year was this? I think 58, 59. Okay. 50, about 58. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, but on the, on the air base, uh, everything was fine. Um, there were quite a few officers that played instruments that had love for the music. Mm -hmm. And because I'd had my little, my little prestige thing going, they mm -hmm. all wanted to come over and play with me because it plays the bass. So. And, and so I had, we had that kind of relationship. There was yeah. no, no, uh, no segregation as far as officers and, okay. and enlisted men. And then every time one of these guys would walk into the, to the barracks or that came that came to see me, uh, guys would snap up, you know. And he says, "Oh, John, uh, <laughs> uh, so and so, let's do, make this gig." You know what I mean? Yeah. And that, that was the end of that. Yeah. Uh, a while in, uh, we were in Shreveport. Like I said, this guy used to come out once a week and talk to me. After that, um, uh, during that period, they had a general conference of all the spiritual people getting together in this big auditorium in town. And I was a part of the group, you know. And I mm -hmm. says, well, why, Johns, we'd like to have you come, but there's nothing we can do to get around this law, you know. So um, they says, we have a solution. You, you comply with the law. You sit up there in the balcony, and there are about five or 600 people out there in the main auditorium there. And of course, I was used to balconies. <laughs> you know, all the movie theaters and yeah. that type of thing. Yeah. Sure, I was used to balconies. Uh -huh. And uh, <clears throat> so I put on my uniform, full dress, you know, because I wanted to, to have this experience just mm -hmm. to see. So I went through that experience. And here was the representative from the main office talking out there, giving his talking to the spiritual group, you know. And, and uh, so the meeting was over, and he came over and shook my hand. And that was the end of that. Hmm. So later on, uh, uh, in the band thing, uh, the military part, uh, this is unrelated to the, the meeting. Uh, they said, John, uh, we have an opening for you to ship out someplace if you want. Where is this? Newfoundland. Newfoundland? Newfoundland. Uh, Ernest Harmon Air Force Base. That's where all the, the military planes used to go through. I, I, not all of them, but a great deal of them mm -hmm. used to go through uh, during the days when they had props. 
Yeah. These four engine jobs. It stopped. Elvis Presley came through there and stopped uh -huh. over. And Refueling if, spot. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm, a few others. So I said, okay. I went up to the to uh, Ernest Harmon Air Force Base. Stayed two years. Drifts were as high as this ceiling. Oh, God. <laughs> Eight foot drifts. You know what I mean? And. Uh, I had a chance to practice. I couldn't go outside. I mean, so I practiced. You know? Again, no distractions, right? Yeah. Now, one thing about all three duties, all these duties that I mentioned, mm -hmm. Montana, the social life was poor, so I practiced. Three years. Went out, played for a year or so, a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Came back into New Mexico, found the teacher, and I practiced eight to 10 hours a day. Now, what could you do? And then I continued this process on and on, remembering that you have a goal to become the world's greatest bass player. Mm -hmm. So I practiced, practiced. I'd go in, have breakfast, 7 o'clock in the morning, go back as if it were a job, practice until about noon, go back and have lunch, then practice all afternoon, unless we had a special rehearsal or mm -hmm. we had to play the flag down. Then I might go to the movies for a couple of hours at 6 till about 7.30 or 8, then come back and practice for a couple of hours until about 10 o'clock at night, and then go to the barracks at night and then start the process over the next day. And that's where that happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Great Falls, uh, did I say Great Falls? Uh, Newfoundland. Newfoundland was no different. Yeah. You know? uh, they had social problems up there. They had private clubs. No. Oh. And as, unless you remember the club, you couldn't get in. Mm -hmm. I didn't know any, any members that were black members. Uh -huh. So it was a sort of like a subtle thing. Yeah. But one-on-one, one-on-one, -on -one, I found that the, the, the 99 or 98 percent of the people that I met have always been nice people. Mm -hmm. It's just that the, the laws were mm -hmm. in such a state that, uh, that it had influenced thinking. And some people had grown up with the, with the, the mentality that they were, uh, in some ways, superior because, uh, in some ways. But I knew differently. I still know differently. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there's no such thing. It's, it's just an individual matter. It's just who you are as a person. And maybe that's what I always sensed about individuals. And and somehow, whenever they said or did something that was, that was disturbing. Somehow it would just sort of go away. It didn't bother me. I, yeah. I, I don't know why. Was there ever a conflict between uh, your choice of jazz-oriented music and your spirituality? Was that any? Was there any kind of these don't work together for you? Well, as a kid, I'd heard that the blues and rhythm was, was the devil's music, mm -hmm. and. And I didn't really listen to the blues that much. It, I heard it because it was a part of the, the scene. Yeah. Uh, getting back to that high school thing, I remember hearing uh, Louis Jordan swing on, on the jukebox, seeing Cal Dione and all those things. And I'd see them in movies. Uh, and I heard uh, Tommy Dorsey's and he'd play that long trombone solo on mm -hmm. it, which was very nice. And I loved those things. They were all based on the blues. And uh, of course, the church was in there too. I used to go to church all the time and I'd hear them sing. And I knew that there was a difference between the church and the school. Uh, it didn't seem real. It seemed like to me like church was uh, unrealistic as compared to the things that I experienced every day in school. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, seems like some kind of pie in the sky thing because he always preached the same sermons, mm. and it was always hell and and uh, what do you call it? Hell and brimstone or something? Fire and brimstone. And unless yeah. you come up and give me your no. hand and, yeah. and do such a thing, he says, uh, you're going to die and go to hell in a minute. <laughs> so and that, what, what about that? Huh? <laughs> now, my buddy, speaking about that, that hell and brimstone thing, uh, my, uh, my buddies, you know, we were all about 9 or 10 years old. They were a little bit older than I was. So I saw them go up and give the preacher's hand one day, yeah. you know. And, and he says, well, it's very nice for these young men to join the church, you know. So, so I, said, I didn't want to be outdone by my buddies, so I went up <laughs> and gave the preachers my hand. Uh -huh. and, 
and he asked me some questions and I turned my head and whispered to no part of my voice and, and he would translate to the audience and the, well that's very fine so we're all baptized you know and I was with my buddies again you know mm -hmm. and that's how that, that that part of it started that church thing wow and that's all there was to do uh -huh. mm -hmm. you had rock and roll really making a big impact you know with Elvis and all those guys yeah. did, did that affect I didn't like Elvis okay no I says he's a musician I'm a musician I says his music doesn't sound as good as mine Mm -hmm. But he had that gyration going, yeah. those knees going. Yeah. So showbiz, you know, and playing guitar. I, did, I didn't care for country music. But strange thing, strangely enough, as a kid, I used to hear it every Saturday night on Grand Ole Opry. Uh -huh. And there was one guy that I liked whose name was Grandpa Jones. The reason why I like Grandpa Jones because he used to talk about uh, that good old Mountain Dew. Oh, really? And I love the lyrics to that. And I used to just wait around and be a few minutes late to school just to hear that. Mm. Yeah, Grandpa Jones. But the rest of the country music I didn't care for. Yeah. Yeah. But later on, I discovered that it was like a, a cousin to, to jazz, yeah. you know. And I've also discovered that there are some very fine musicians involved in country music. Mm -hmm. um, and when I hear them in person, I get more out of a kick watching them in yeah. person than I do listening. Mm -hmm. You know, and then the lyrics are, are so simple and they are so down to earth and so basic that the, you know they, in, in a lot of cases, they're worth listening to. So, when did you decide that again you needed to exit from the Air Force? About four or five years later. Yeah. Five years later, um, I, I exited the Air Force and then went to Philly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I was married to my wife, who I've been married to for about 40 years. Same woman. Huh? Yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's amazing. She's the one encouraged the, that encouraged this, uh, the musical thing. She mm -hmm. says, you might be sorry someday if you, if if you don't do you that. Don't. And it took a lot on her part to do yeah, that. Yeah, sure. Then uh, after about a year and a half, I began to have uh, uh, get a job at uh, Acme Markets, a food chain, working mm -hmm. in the main office as a mail boy. I had a kid and a wife, and they paid me $48 a week. And so I was working gigs at night, uh, Reddington or, no, not Redding, Redding. Redding. Redding, yeah. Yes, Redding. And all around the area, the Cherry Hill area, the Philadelphia area, and just working gigs. And uh, one day I came home after a, a long day, and I saw this telegram. I opened it up, he says, uh, opportunity, if interested, give me a call. So I, you know, just laid on the table. You know. I think a few days later I called, and, uh, and it was a woman that answered the phone who was, uh, happened to be a member of a very prominent family in New Jersey. As a matter of fact, he, at one time, he was attorney general. His name is, uh, was Walter Reed. And it was his wife, Mrs. Reed, had written the telegram, and she said, well, I have this thing that uh, I'm a friend of Duke Ellington's, and uh, maybe we could uh, set you up with uh, some kind of contact there. If you, All you have to do is come over to the house, and we'll have a little party, and we'll have some Cornish hen, bring your family and your kids and all that, and we'll invite a few other people, and we'll invite some musicians to play along with you. And uh, I said, oh, huh, in the back of my mind, I said, she wants some free music for her party. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, so uh, <clears throat> this went along, and uh, we set up a date. And uh, I piled my, my son in the back of the station wagon, and my wife, we all went over the base. And we went over to Riverton, New Jersey, which was across the river from Philly. Mm -hmm. And um, they played, and she stuck a tape recorder down there. And I, I was aware that the tape recorder was there. So what I decided to do, I decided to play in the style of Jimmy Blanton. So I played in the style of Jimmy Blanton. You know, playing that very basic driving beat. And uh, so a few weeks later, she shoved it in front of Duke when he came to the steel, went to the steel pier. Uh -huh. And then somehow through all of this, 
bad recording, you heard these, these notes coming out. And speaking of Jimmy Blanton, uh, I heard about him when I was in Great Falls, Montana. Uh, some guy was coming through with a band. And he says, have you heard of Jimmy Blanton? I said, no. He says, well, let, let me write you out one of his, his famous solo called mm -hmm. Jack the Bear. So he wrote it out for me, and he played it for me. So I learned it, uh -huh. and then I went down to the store in Montana, and I bought the record, you know, and, and uh -huh. learned it, you know. And, uh, you know, years later, I met the same guy in San Francisco I was on the road with Duke later on. That's interesting how they oh. all came back. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, she played this thing for Duke, and Duke uh, heard it. And one day I was sitting, I was living in a housing project by then, a housing project. And I was comfortable, and my kids walking around. I got this phone call. Good evening, uh, Mr. Lamb. Yes, this is Duke Ellington. I said, who? Duke Ellington. I said, just a moment, please. So I went back in there, told my wife, I said, that's Duke Ellington on the phone. I walked back. She didn't, you know, she's very cool about that, you know. So I walked back and I says, yes, what can I do for you, Mr. Ellington? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he says, well, look here, Mr. Lama, we'd, we'd like you to come up to New York and, uh, and play some things with us. So, okay, fine. To set up a day. He says, well, uh, we, we're up a place called Freedom Land. Uh, why, don't, why don't you try coming up there, uh, let's say, by Tuesday or so. Fine. Bye. That was it. So uh, I hopped on the, the train in North Station in Philly, took my base. This is before we had the wheel. Mm -hmm. And I carried it. <laughs> yeah. Hopped on the train, went up to New York, Got off the train, on, uh, it was all on a Tuesday. Got off the train and went to, uh, got on another train and went up to the Bronx and at, we ran out of subway. And so I had to take a taxi from there. Mm. So I took a taxi and over to Freedom Land, which is, uh, at that time was a, sort of like a resort area or an entertainment place. Mm -hmm. And I walked in the place back there, back to the tents. I saw this guy walking around with his slippers on, and I said, that looks like Johnny Hodges. I, I'd seen his pictures, you know. And uh, walked back through there, and he says, where's the, the, the band? I asked the guy. He says, oh, back there. So I went back into the tent, walked in, and there was this guy sitting up with this blue outfit on and had this blue bandana around his head. The television was blasting, blaring. It was distorted. I mean, it was so loud, you know. And he was fixed on that television set. It turns out that it was Duke. And uh, I was approached by the band boy, and uh, he says, Do you hear the new bass player? I said, Yeah. And he says, Hey, Duke, the bass player is here. And then Duke stands up, you know, and he walks, very gracious, very nice man. He, he was uh, like perfect uh, six feet, or perfect mannequin, so to speak, you know, oh. so graceful, even in that outfit that he had on, mm -hmm. you know. And he's very soft-spoken, and as a matter of fact, I says, hmm, I'm in the presence of something here, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and he told me, he says, well, uh, yeah, he says, you want to take the next set, the uh, second half of the show? <laughs> yeah. I said, okay. Um, then the band boy says, can he read? <laughs> yeah, I can read, you know. So I went on up and uh, did, uh, Peck Morrison was the bass player at the time. He was there for a short time. Uh -huh. And uh, so I went and played the second show. The first tune we did was stopping that sad boy. I saw this blur, you know, when he's kicking off the off the tune, I didn't, you know, most band leaders would do something like this, you know. Yeah. I didn't see him that he just did like that and the band started. <laughs> I says, uh oh, this is a train. <laughs> so I, I hopped on the train and we didn't quit until the end. 
It was in the key of D flat, stopping at the subway. Okay, the next tune I did was uh, one of the tunes from his Far East Suite. He had written that. And uh, I looked at the music. I said, this is written in fourths. I said, that's going to be very muddy. You know, I, I, said, I can't, can't play that that low and that muddy mm -hmm. with a low A on the bottom. and deep. So I put reversed everything, made it in fifths. Uh-huh. In fifths. And some guy says he had noticed that I was changing Duke's music. <laughs> Putting the notes, you know. Yeah. He said, what's he doing, you know? So I changed the music around and um, played. It was a bass solo in the very beginning. Matter of fact, that, that same thing um, was recorded uh, afterwards, and it, it uh, received uh, an award. Mm -hmm. um, so we played that, that Far East thing, and uh, Cootie's his. Mm -hmm. You know, that's all. Because, you know. Everybody shook their head, you know. Yeah, so that was the end of that. And the bass player came back up. Talk about trial by fire. Yeah, Jeez. that's what it was. So I uh, went in and did that, and I went on back to, uh, to Philly. The next day, another bass player was supposed to come by. Mm -hmm. but what happened? Somebody was supposed to pick him up, and the person didn't pick him up. And he didn't get the gig, of course. He never showed up. He was depending upon somebody else, yeah. whereas I took the train and lugged that thing up there, and, and that, that probably made the difference. And, uh, and the ability to uh, play the bass notes. That's all it is, is playing the bottom of whatever is required. And uh, shortly after that, I got another phone call back in Philly. It was from Mercer. Uh, Mercer says, uh, Hey, John, uh, Pop, Pop wants you to come up to, uh, to New York on, like, Monday or so. Uh, a couple of weeks, I, well, I had to quit my job. You know, I had a day job. I had to quit. Yeah. I had to get in. This is, and uh, so I said, OK, I'll, I'll arrange that. The first gig was with Mercer, with his band. He had picked up some guys in oh, New York, right. all the New York musicians, including Grant Green, the guitar player, mm -hmm. and a whole lot of others. And Duke came in the next night, and we began at Basin Street East and stayed for two or three weeks and then went on the road for a while as part of the story. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. This was 1964? Next 64, right? Yeah. 1964. What kind of um, salary was, did he offer you? Well, um, my being naive about salaries, Anything was better than what I was getting, $48 a week. And so they decided to start me off the scale. They had to pay me the scale. It was about 60 or something a week, a night, I guess, mm -hmm. in so, New York. I'm sorry, 60 a night? Yeah, probably uh -huh. 60 a, a job or something like that. And yeah, uh, the stars were getting all the money. And my being, not knowing anything about charges and all that and prices, I was just happy to to get a gig. Uh, yeah. I was been making $48 a week mm -hmm. <laughs> at Acme Markets. Yeah. So $60 a night was great. Right. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and then compared to $50 a week at that other place yeah. years ago. Right. And so I, I worked my way up. Then Who was gradually the, it began to increase. Yeah. And you were responsible for your own uh, putting Everything. yourself up. Yeah. The whole thing. I was responsible right now. Yeah. But um, I began to pull my way up a little bit gradually financially, and my wife was being the type of person that she is, utilized the money sir, mm -hmm. in a very positive way. Uh, when I went overseas with them, I, I, as a matter of fact, I didn't like, like the band and, at all. I didn't like uh, the way they did their business. Uh, everything seemed so unorganized. So uh, I, had, I had heard something about that. that yeah. That getting everybody on the stand it sometimes was just a chore, and yeah, maybe that's not right. everybody had the same attitude you did about professionalism. Well, I had been in the military. I was taught to be on time. Uh huh. Everybody else came in little by little. It didn't matter. They'd done it 40 or 50 years. You know, they had the gig anyway. But uh, Duke would come up and begin to play the piano. His call, do 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 do. He'd do that for about 10 minutes or so, and then. One other guy would come in, then another one come in, and so on. But I was always there. 
because you know I'm the bottom of the pole, you know. Yeah. 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 The baby, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And um, they they uh, they had very very strong personalities. Those people. I had to sort of like draw from my military experience in order to survive that. Mm -hmm. uh, my confidence level. Otherwise, confidence could have been crushed. You had to be very sure of yourself in a band like that. Everybody was so individualized. I see. It's amazing mm. that he could hold it together. Well, um, he would listen, and he would put all of this together in composition. <laughs> He'd listen. Anybody said something, he just let it go, you know. And. Uh, but there are times he would get the band together and he'd give them a piece of his mind. And everybody was, he'd say some things that I'd never heard anybody else say. And he'd walk around and he'd tell each person, this is the way it is, you know. And then he'd go back to his regular self. <laughs> what kind of things would he say? Well, he, I can't mention that yeah, on camera. Right, okay. Yeah, we don't say that kind of stuff. Right. But he, he would use some words that, uh, uh -huh. that were not too pleasant to him. So every once in a while he had to kind of... Yeah, he had to straighten everybody out. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. But most of the time he was just easy going. And if he they, found somebody not pulling their end of the bargain, mm -hmm. he would feature them a lot. Oh. Yeah. Like Paul used to go to sleep on the stand a lot. Mm -hmm. He'd always pull Paul out and feature him two or three times in a row, you know. <laughs> and... Uh, it's one way to keep them awake. Right. Yeah. Who was the drummer when you joined? We had several. Sam Woodyard was the first one that yeah. I worked with. And then Louis came in. And then there was Rufus Jones. And then there was the other Jones. Elvin Jones was there for, for a short time. Yeah, I you look amazed. I was amazed too. <laughs> and there was another fellow they used for Chris Colombo. Uh, not Columbus, Columbus. Chris Columbus or Colombo? They I, fell out of. Uh, out of Atlantic City. Huh. Chris, I call him Chris. Okay. But he was president of the local there for a while. Oh. And he worked with the band for a while. And uh, there were several others that sat in uh, for briefly. And uh, it just went on and on. Um, and sometimes we'd have substitutes too. You ever hear a guy by the name of Jala Brand? Yes, sure. He had his first gig with Duke. He's from South Africa. Isn't yeah. He? There was a guy by the name of Wolf Freeman who was from South Africa, bass mm -hmm. player. He used to come in. He had to come in by way of Canada mm -hmm. and then to the United States. And I used to see him out there in New York uh, at uh, Basin Street all the time. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. yeah. There seemed to be quite a turnover, in the, at least in the drum chair. Well, um, not really. They were just substitutes. Oh, okay. Short term, yeah. short term players. It, it's in this book here. Yeah. 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 Um, he kept the same people. He had the same saxophone section the whole time I was there. Right. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with all of those players. Sure. Yeah. And the same trombone players, including Buster Cooper, who is in town here. He lives right. in St. Pete. And um, Chuck Connors and Lawrence Brown. And Fort Cootie and Cat Anderson. Sometimes he had Ray Nance. And mm -hmm. he had Money Johnson sometimes. And had Mercer, who was a business manager as well. That was Herbie Jones. And uh, the weight of the band, like, was most of the time was on the drummer and myself as far as keeping time. So I just kept that time. Right. There was yeah. no rhythm guitar. No. And Duke didn't always play all that much. No, not either. all the time, no. Yeah. No. And whatever he put up there, I, you know, I had to be observant enough to, to catch it, either from his keyboard or from listening to the band or from reading something that they had written out they had sketched out something, you know, I had to create a line to that. Or if they didn't have the music, I had to draw from things I had heard years ago, like the old standards. Uh -huh. that, that's what I, where I learned most of those, just by just playing it with other groups mm -hmm. over a period of time. Were the, the veterans in that band, uh, did you have to, like, prove yourself to them? Did, were they... Uh, in their attitude towards you? You were always the newcomer? Well, um, to some degree. Um, but I was kind of cocky. I knew what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And what they had to say didn't, didn't matter. 
there was one guy that came over to me once and said, uh, we'd like to welcome, we'd like to welcome you to the band, Harry Carney. Mm -hmm. I shook my hand. He says, enjoy and good luck. And uh, there was one guy one night said something to me about uh, something about the rhythm. I says, well, look, I can play your part better than you can. And it's a different instrument. So just go ahead and play your part if you can. That was the end of that. And which I could. I could play his part better than he could. Uh -huh. Yeah. And so um, you had to assert yourself a little bit. I see. Yeah. It wasn't the boy In a scouts. quiet way. <laughs> yeah. 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 Did you get to witness um, Duke collaborating with um, with Strayhorn? Yeah, much. Yeah, I, I've seen him come in, uh, collaborate, uh, preparing for a television show. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, they would talk you know, around the piano, and I've seen them talk during recording sessions. Uh, once uh, Billy gave me some music and. So just measures and no notes, no chord changes. Oh, just play what you hear. Oof. Yeah, that's what, play what you hear. I've seen that. A lot of times they didn't write anything for the bass. That seems amazing to me because, I mean, it, that's where it all starts. Yeah. And if you're doing something that, well, it certainly can change the sound of the whole exactly. thing. Exactly. Exactly. Maybe, was, maybe that was his trust mm -hmm. that was coming through. Well, I'm, I'm in the band, you know. I have yeah. to, I have to prove, I have to prove that I, I'm worthy of being here. I guess, you uh -huh. know. So, um, having that base here, I was able to do that. Yeah, yeah. A couple of the recordings um, that you did while you were with him, I was curious about. Didn't he do one uh, music of Mary Poppins? Yes, that was my in? first album. Yeah. Was that a, a decision by him to do that music, or was that something that would have come from the record company? Was it for Reprise or RIC? I, uh, I think it was on Reprise. Yeah, it was a Frank Sinatra label, right? Yeah. At that time. Well, he had to satisfy so many... Some contracts so many, and so forth. Yeah. yeah, so many a year, I suppose. Oh. Mm -hmm. Sure, so he did it, did it in his way, and Billy says, play... Uh, do this this way, um, I guess you call it a shake, or he says Ponticelli. I'm not certain what the ter term is now. I'd have to look it up. It's been so long. Uh, At the introduction. Tremolo, maybe, or yeah, something? something yeah, something like right. that. Right, okay. And he says, play it this way. And that's how that happened, you know. And then there were other spots where he didn't, he just have sketches or outlines of measures. And sometimes he'd have a note here. So what you hear is uh, was the was the first album mm -hmm. that I did. Yeah, it was done in Chicago at uh, Universal Studios. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that kind of collaboration, and Billy would tell me he says uh, sometimes he'd play piano with us, and he says keep playing those low E's. You want to hear that bottom, and I learned that the bottom of the bass is where it is. You know, after all, you're a bass player. Mm -hmm. uh, in a group like that, somebody has to play the foundation. And I noticed that today, a lot of cats are, are sort of like infatuated with the, the upper register. It sounds good, but somebody has to play the bass. Otherwise, you have a group without a bass. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it's, it, that's a, it's an area that hasn't, uh, been fully explored that part of the instrument, but that's not the only part of the instrument. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing like having a, a matter of fact, it's more difficult to play the lower notes than it is to play the higher notes. Uh -huh. I mean, to get a rich bottom, nice, firm, bass quality sound. Yeah. yeah. Um, when, when Louis Belson joined the group, was there any kind of uh, problem with him being white? When no, the there's no problem with Louis. <laughs> no, there's no problem with Louis. <laughs> no. No. Oh, I know that. I there's no problem. I didn't see any problems no. at all. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Louis is a sweetheart. 
and Paul was a sweetheart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everybody loved those guys. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah, They're, all, all those guys, uh, each one had the, their own characteristics, and each one, I learned to, to appreciate them for what they were and what they, they had to offer and who they were. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, and they were all unique. If you understood that, and I think that's what apparently Duke understood each person. And you could put all this together, and all of this comes through is love and understanding. Yeah. Yeah. What was it like going overseas with the group? Well, uh, after I told Mercer, I said, well, I don't, uh, I don't care for this. I think I'll go back to Philly. Yeah. It's not what I thought it was. How long? And is it? I'm sorry? How long were you in the band? When like you... two or three months. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or maybe a month or so. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I, said, I don't care for this. Well, Mercy says, well, why don't you go overseas first? Then make your decision. It says we're going over in around January or February or something yeah. like that. So, uh, okay, I, I, I hung in there and we went overseas. And uh, I just, I discovered, <laughs> I discovered that. Uh, the audiences were much different. Mm -hmm. That made an impression. They were quite receptive to the, that uh, Duke's band. And I noticed that when I be went to England, there I was, my picture was in the, the program. Not a picture, but a statement. Uh -huh. They say, this young man reminds us of the great Jimmy Blanton and his sound. I said, hmm. Looks good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then in another place in France, they had my picture on the front page. We were artists. Yeah. We weren't just uh, somebody just playing an instrument. Mm -hmm. And uh, the people showed it. Uh, there was once a fellow that uh, I met that I asked to carry my bass, who was a cabbie. Uh, if he would take it to the concert hall, he took the instrument, put it on top of his cab, tied it down, he called me sir. It's an entirely different thing than I had experienced yeah. over here earlier, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hopped in, he closed the door, walked in, and I gave him a, I was, a nice tip, I hope, because it was far an exchange, yeah. And, uh, the, the people were always so, so warm and receptive. Uh, I guess that's what it meant, meant at that time to be a, a celebrity over with Duke Ellington. Yeah. Uh, and then when we got back over here, I took a, a, a bus, city bus, put with the base, hopped on the bus, and the driver says, where are you going with that thing? <laughs> well, I'm going to the city, you know? But I'm sure the difference in the attitude. Yeah. yeah. Welcome home. Uh, yeah. We were well received there. We were received over here by fans. All the fans of Duke were, you know, uh, loved Duke. But those that didn't understand the music or didn't have anything to do with it, we were just, you know, mm. in my opinion. Yeah. When the, the years you were with him were uh, pretty intense times for civil rights. Was there any, um, did that movement affect Ellington at all, and, or, or the operations of the band? Well, I don't, I don't think it affected Ellington and his, uh, his attitudes, but uh, I'm sure he had some thoughts about it because he had thoughts about everything. Mm -hmm. uh, but we did run into a few riots. Hmm. One in the, the one in L.A. Oh. We were playing at... Uh, Disneyland, and the riot broke out that night, and they wouldn't let us back to our places. We couldn't get back there. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. We couldn't go through certain sections of town. Uh -huh. Things were burning. And when we were outside of, uh, once we were outside of uh, Detroit, a similar thing happened. They wouldn't let us in town. Mercer made the announcement. It says, we can't stay in town now, you fellas. We have to stay on our skirts, you know. And, uh, once in Milwaukee, 
we went in with the armed guard, I believe. Wow. They escorted us through the thing. They're, they're having some problems up there. Yeah. Those are three, three uh, cases that I remember. Yeah. Yeah. Did the uh, fellows in that band have like, I don't know if this is the right word, but did they have any hobbies that helped them get through all that time they spent on a bus or just on the road? Oh, yes. Um, Herbie Jones was a photographer. Mm -hmm. He took pictures of guys in the band, and some guys would walk, and some guys would cook. Johnny Hodges did that, he was mm -hmm. a cook. And uh, some were just, uh, just enjoyed the each new town as it as they came yeah. to it. But they they had their little hobbies, and but you usually after a night on the bus you're tired. Yeah. You know. You have time to eat and then make the next concert and go to the next gig. Yeah. Sure. One after the other. Mm -hmm. Yes. Did it get hard um, with your family situation? Oh, yes. Yeah. It was hard. Um, I'll never forget the look on my wife's face the night that I went on the road. Wish I could take that face and just transform it into something else, but it was a, it was a, a look of, a, you know, a, a, a true sense of separation. Mm -hmm. yeah. But we received a lot of encouragement from people that uh, that had been on the road for a while. I see. Yeah, the wives and people that, uh, like Mrs. Reed, she encouraged us quite a bit. And she kept in contact with my wife. And she said, the sound is important. And one guy said on the bus one day, he says, uh, hey, John, don't play this thing cheap. He says, uh, this is going to be very important one of these days. He says, you don't. I know how you feel, but the, it, it's this is important. He said these people love this guy. He was he was one of the copyists for the band. Oh, and he went through his headaches trying to copy Duke's music because he didn't copy for each instrument. He copied for individuals, and he'd have the lines all crossed, and you'd have to just uh, siphon through all these lines to get. And he understood, you know, the techniques. Herbie Jones was uh, was a copyist. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that must have been a chore. Yeah, it was. Yeah. <laughs> sure, he wrote these lines for each person. And it all came out the way uh, it sounded distorted to them. Mm -hmm. But to Duke, that's what he wanted. Yeah. And he always found a way to incorporate each new personality into the band. Yes. Well, since those years, you've remained major living as a musician and uh, how did you end up back in, in Florida? Well, we were reading a series of articles uh, about uh, life in Sarasota. Uh -huh. And I had uh, attended the college, and I had been there five years, and I had gotten my double degree, and I taught in Philly for a couple of years mm -hmm. um, in the prep department at the school as well as uh, middle school. And uh, so we hopped in the car and we drove down to Sarasota and Miami and all those places and we checked the places out. We decided that Sarasota was not it for us. Mm -hmm. So we moved back up to, came up to Philadelphia, uh, St. Petersburg and uh, discovered that that's where Buster Cooper lived, my old road buddy. And said, well, Buster lives here and this is centrally located. Tampa's here, Clearwater's here, Sarasota's here. This is the place to be. So we decided on St. Petersburg. And on top of that, I wanted my kids to grow up with a proper attitude. Uh -huh. I didn't want them to have to fight their way to school and back. You know, in the inner city, like, uh, a lot of problems can happen uh -huh. like that with other kids and groups and that type of thing. How many kids did you have? Do Two. You have? Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, so that's how we ended up here down here. The kids, plus uh, I had the the ability to teach now, I had the license to teach, so I uh -huh. came down and uh, went to the insurance business for a year. Yeah. And uh, they said, are you crazy? Well, I could still play a little bit, and I decided after a year that that wasn't for me, and uh, decided that I would get into the orchestra. 
concerts. I played with the orchestra, the Tampa Bay Orchestra. Mm -hmm. And uh, my wife and kids were there the first night, the opening night. But I soon discovered that wasn't for me because uh, we had to rehearse and rehearse and rehearse the same thing over yeah. and over again. And, uh, and the, the conductor would, would go crazy uh, sometimes and offer $25, you know what I mean, for, for, <laughs> for rehearsal. And I discovered that with the, I could come back, back over to uh, the, a hotel and make maybe two fifty a week or so, uh -huh. and and just have a, a great time. So I did that. Yeah. And um, also during that time, I played with the Opera House here for about two or three years. Got that little experience under my belt. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the meantime, I got this gig teaching uh, high school taught high school, and when that came along, I got a job teaching at the junior college. The word began to get around, yeah. and I began to teach uh, the different schools, and then I went to middle school and stayed there over 20 years, and I retired after 25 years in the middle school, 27 years all total teaching. Were you teaching music? I was teaching music, uh -huh. and math. And math. And, and language arts, and social studies. Uh, and then uh, while, while I was in this math thing, I became recertified. I went to the uh, JC and picked up, uh, what, 16 credits. I'll be and immediately after that was done, they took me out of math and put me back into music. So I became a choral director and a uh, band director. Mm -hmm. wow. And then I decided that that was the end of it. But in the mean, during all of this time, I would uh, continued to to play, to play. Yeah. play on weekends and nights. And one night they had a one uh, year they had a jazz policy, where I worked six nights a week. All the jazz artists came in from all oh, guys that were on the road, for one year. Mm. Uh, it was at uh, Tierra Verde, uh, Tierra Verde Island Resort, I believe it's called. Uh, we played there for all the greats, with a trio. It was called the John Lamb Trio, and we went to the reviews every week, and we, um, we had a great time with that. Wow. Sure. You've had an amazing life. Well, uh, <laughs> I would say that uh, it's great. Yeah. Wonderful. And it's still amazing. Mm -hmm. it, it seems to be getting bigger and bigger. Totally it doesn't cool. end. You know, and I, all I did was, at the time when I was, I was looking for employment, I was I was trying to survive, mm -hmm. and uh, I'll tell you what one thing, this thing about becoming the world's greatest bass player, one night I was on stage with Barney, Barney uh, Briggs, is that Barney the Bunny? Barney Bunny Berrigan? No, no? The, um, the tap dancer. Oh, yeah. Well, um, Bunny. B Briggs. Yeah, yeah. Barney Briggs, is, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, uh, <clears throat> We were playing and he was dancing. And then he went up to the mic and he says, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you to the world's greatest bass player. I said to myself, I made it. <laughs> Isn't that something? That is excellent. Just one person yeah. said that. And I said, I made it. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's something. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, uh, uh, you and I realize there's no such thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Everybody has their way of expressing themselves. Yeah. It's just different, and uh, it depends on personal taste. Right. You know, a note's a note. Right. <laughs> sure. Well, I really want to thank you for your time. We, we, uh -huh. we, we chatted for quite a long time here. And oh, yes. What do you think of the state of uh, jazz today? Oh, man, it's blooming all over the place. Yeah. It's blossoming. Yeah. I love what I see. Mm. I mean, you can go on the internet, you can get anything you want. Yeah. It's all there. It's beautiful. And more concerts, more everything. Yeah. I have more, more gigs than I can handle. Don't tell the guys up north now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We don't need them all coming down here, right? Yeah. <laughs> but you see, uh, speaking of that, um, I had a choice between going, I could go anywhere. I could, could have gone to LA to to try to do the studios mm -hmm. thing. I could have gone to New York or I could have gone anywhere. 
but I chose to come to a little place like St. Petersburg. And it has blossomed into a big thing. It's like uh, the old story about the mountain coming to Muhammad. That's what happened. Mm -hmm. All you need is the, the concept and work long and hard enough. Uh, persistence. You don't necessarily need a great deal of talent, but you need the drive, the energy to get you where you'd like to go. Mm -hmm. Well said. Well, thanks for your time today. Well, thank this, you very much. Really My pleasure. Right. Yeah.